Jesus, 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 Jesus. Let's pray for the word. Let's pray for our hearts this service that our hearts are fertile grounds for the word of God that is God. Let's pray for ourselves that we are attentive. We discern. We rightly divide the word of God. Let's pray that our hearts are ready to receive the word and the minister that's going to be bringing God's word to us this morning. Let's pray against distractions. Let's pray that our minds are focused. We pay attention to the word that is God because it is beneficial to us. Pray. In the spirit of prayer, let's pray that our hearts are attentive to the words of the Spirit. Hey, just bow your heads, pray.
on what to do, how to find your specific purpose. There are thousands of books. There are thousands of documentaries. There are thousands of motivational speakers. So, the difference between today and every other motivational speaker or every other book you will read is that you get to see it from the light of the Word of God. You understand what I'm saying? So that should define your view of how you're going to propose. Yeah. The purpose of God is a broad topic. Yes. It's a broad topic that probably one Sunday is not going to be enough to cover. But we are going to learn on a specific part which is called purpose, the purpose driven life. Purpose. Purpose. The purpose driven life. Yeah. Purpose driven life. It's easy. Life driven by purpose. What that means is that for everything that you do, you do it with the intention of purpose in your mind. It is towards an end goal. It is towards the ultimate end goal, which is purpose. Yeah, for purpose. First of all, to know about purpose, yeah, the first thing you need to know is that it's not about you when it comes to purpose. Because the book of Proverbs, verses 19 from 21, speaking, will say, There are many plans in a man's heart. But nevertheless, the Lord's counsel will stand. Can you give me an idea? Yes. There are many plans in a man's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. So that is to say that regardless of what you do, regardless of what you think, if it is outside of the purpose of the Lord, it's not going to trump what God has in mind. Do you understand? So instead of doing what you want, why not just do what you want but within a concept? Do you understand? Let's take for example, I know that now is the concept of freedom, like I want to do what I want, how I want, when I want to do it. That is a guitar. Huh? I have a guitar. I can play the guitar. I can hold the guitar. Um, can I make a, please can you help me the guitar? Oh, please. Yeah. Let's let the listen. Yeah, anyone? I just thanks. Okay. So it's important here that you understand the picture I'm trying to paint. Let's say this guitar was made for a specific reason, but to make music. It's my guitar, I'm free to play it however I want to play it, right? If I turn this guitar this way and I play, are you going to hear anything? Mm, but it is my guitar, I can choose to play it like this. But if I play this guitar the way it is designed to be played, you're going to hear good music. That is the same thing with purpose. In as much as we are free to do whatever we want, we can only be free within a particular concept or within a particular context. And that context is the purpose of God. And whenever it comes to purpose here, like I said, it is not about you, but it is about purpose. It's not about you, but it is about who? The Creator. Because everything in this life has a reason for which it was created. And who is our Creator? Come on, I need to hear you guys. Who is our Creator? God. Thank you. So that means God has a reason for why we are created. And every other reason outside of the reason 
that God created us is what a counterfeit. You guys understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And purpose is not necessarily about what you do. Hear me again. Purpose is not about what you do. Because you see people, why are you on this earth? They'll say, I am here to do good. I am here to do this. I am here. Purpose is not about what you do. Purpose is about the intent of the creator. I'm going to stress on that. Purpose is about the intent of the creator. As you've read today, God is our creator. You can do all that things, but those other things does not define your purpose. Because if you were not on this earth, your purpose is more or less like, that is the reason why you're here. Without you, there is a fatal flaw to that end. Like there's an end to which you are created, and without you, there is a fatal flaw, and that end cannot be achieved. But we'll get into that for a minute. Let me use an example. Let me use another example. Um, a carpenter makes a bed. Uh, a bed is meant for sleeping. You can sleep on the bed, but you lie on the bed to sleep. You can also lie down on the floor to sleep. So, is the purpose of the bed to sleep? No. Because like I said, purpose is not about what you do, it is the intent. The reason why the bed, you prefer to sleep, you prefer to sleep on the bed rather than the floor is because of comfort. So the purpose of the bed is comfort. Do you understand? Yeah. So at the point where, because honestly, like, what is the point for beds at home if you can sleep on the floor? Like, think about it. Yeah? What's the point of wearing shoes if you can walk with your bare feet? Hmm? You understand? So, purpose is based on the intent of who? The Creator. Let us go to Revelation 4 verse. Revelation 4 verse 11. You can go back to the NKJ. For the, if you've been coming for the 
Whether it be Sunday school. We talked about this, so I'm not going to go back to it. You're not, if you're not there, hopefully God will you. You're going to understand where we are going to. But anyhow, let's go. Revelation 4, verse 11 says that we are created for the pleasure of God. We've come to Genesis and we have seen that God created life and the light was good. Yeah, just a quick summary. Someone asked me later, this light here, the light that he referred to there, was not um, the sun. Because if you go down you can see that he later created the sun, the moon, and other heavenly bodies. The light there is the light that was that now became the life of men, which is in John 1, which is Jesus Christ. Um, and the rest of that. But anyhow, let's go to Psalm 194, Psalm 149, verse 4. So far, what are the points we've drawn? You see that everything was made for God's pleasure. And now we are answering what pleases God. So we are in Psalm 149, verse 4. For the Lord taketh pleasure in what? In what? He will beautify the meek with salvation. salvation. What made us God's people? Salvation. First of all, if you have not given your life to Christ, please consider this as an avenue. Yeah, it is a wonderful thing to be in the family of God. It is the purpose of every man. First of all, yeah, that you are in the family of God. Because in creation, He created us to be in communion, in fellowship with Him. Like, does everybody understand that part? So please, if you're here and you're still reasoning, if you're going to join the family of Christ, trust me, it is the only thing that makes sense in this life. Yeah. But anyhow, he said, God takes pleasure in his people. What separates his people from other people is what the gift of salvation. Yeah. And why would he take pleasure in his people? What do they do that makes him take pleasure in them? Let's go to Matthew 5, please. Matthew 5. Um, it was talking about the Beatitudes. If you attended some, if you attended Bible study, you will know that we have been studying the book of Matthew. And when we study the book of Matthew 5, it's talking about the kingdom principles. Let's start from verse 14. It was talking about Christian like the godly, sorry, the godly lifestyle, the principles of the kingdom. Matthew 5, verse 14. And then, so if you understand what I said earlier about the light, it's not going to be far fetched when Jesus says that we are the what? We are the light of the world. The city says earlier he started it um this thing. We are the salt of the earth. Actually, go back, let's start from there. Yeah, ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost his savour, where it shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Next verse. Ye are the light of the world. The city set on a hill cannot be hid. Next verse. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel or under a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Next verse. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Yeah? I firmly believe that this is one of the most solid teachings on purpose because when Jesus is talking about the salt of the earth here, he was talking about if the salt loses his purpose, like if we miss the reason why we exist, then why are we still on earth? Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, if we miss the reason why we exist, if we do not function as we have been made to function and we call ourselves the beloved of Christ, why are we still here? Now, why are we still here? Which is a very valid question. And the reason why we do all this is because we will glorify our Father which is in heaven. God takes pleasure in what's his glorification. Which is why he would see that light and say that light is good because that light in Genesis is a reflection of what? His glory. Do you understand? Do you understand? Because the light in Genesis was a reflection of what? His glory. And the reason from Psalm 149 verse 4, why he would take pleasure 
in his people is because everything they do is what to the glory of his name so we have understand that what pleases god now is when what his name is glorified and the rest of that for how then is his name glorified yeah no, this is the bible study we are going to answer a lot of but how then is his name glorified for well, let's go to psalm 147 verse 11 again from 147 verse 11 and give me an idea okay actually I'm just chill the lord take pleasure in them that who in them that what fear him and in them that hope in his mercy and in them that hope in his mercy so if let's do a little bit of Bible study here if you are a concordant student you know that there are two types of fear there is Yira there is Yare one talks about fear as a trembling shake shake rest of that but the other one now talks about reverence now give me an NIV let's see what they translated it to the NIV no sorry amplified God bless Amplified, amplified. Yeah. The Lord takes pleasure in those who reverently and worshipfully fear Him. In those who hope in His mercy. So you see, He takes pleasure who what? Worship Him. Who worship Him. So the fear is coming out from a place of reverence. Actually, that sounds like ontology because I just say that the fear is reverence. But you understand what I'm trying to say. He takes pleasure in those who worship him. So what this verse just helped us to do, it was it classified or it summarized everything the believer does that gives glory to God. Yeah, that pleases him as what worship. So what am I saying? Am I saying that purpose is worship? I'm drawing a very close line between the two of them. Because the truth of the matter is that if you understand what real worship means, then you understand what it means to be in purpose. Because we've said that, and listen, we've said that the reason why God takes pleasure in his people is because they will they glorify him. And then from this verse, say the Lord takes pleasure in those who worship him let's just use that who reverently and worshipfully fear him if you check i think i'm very classic they'll say they'll say worship him or fear him and i've explained that if the lord is taking pleasure in those who worship him then everything that the believer does as the salt and the light of the earth that gives glory to god is summarized as what worship so worship is not just songs Worship is no emotions. Yeah. Because it says in Corinthians that we have the mind of Christ. We do not have the emotions of Christ. Yeah. So our worship we will define how much in how intentional we are about purpose because the thing with purpose is that purpose is practical, it is not for first. But worship is the practicality of purpose. Like, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. You can only practice, let me break it down, you can only practice your purpose in true worship. Because we have summarized that giving glory and everything we do to glorify God is what? Worship. Yeah. And now, we are now going to. You see why the song um, that I Michael, can you just take the key down? Like one. Yeah. Yeah. And now you not see the song, you're like, I will not be silent. I will worship you. Just keep down here. As long as I So you see, 
that son is well informed of what it means to be a man of purpose, as long as you are breathing, you started breathing from the day you came out of your mother's womb. Yeah. You started breathing from the day you came out of your mother's womb till the day you will go under to rest and be with your father. And the song says that as long as what I am breathing, that for every breath I take, it is unto what the glory of God. You understand? So, what am I saying now here? Yeah? That worship is the practicality of purpose. And if you do not understand what worship is, you can never understand how to walk in purpose. And that is the simple truth. It is not about songs. It is not about... No, it is not just about songs. But it is about your entire life. Do you understand? So now, let's understand what worship is. We've already defined worship as everything that gives glory to God or everything that the believer does that gives glory to God. And the truth is that here, if man is made for worship, because the worship of God is so important that he told Jesus that he should tell his disciples to keep quiet. He said that if these people don't praise me, what will happen? The stones. The stones. Do what? So the question is, do you want a stone to take your place? No, because the truth is that when we engage scriptures here, we would engage scripture with the mind of Christ that we have. And everything that Jesus would do, Jesus would say that is so that the name of what God be what glorified. So whatever Jesus did, Jesus did it from what? From the lens of worship. And to walk in purpose, we need to learn to see things from that lens. So now let us understand what worship is if we are going to say that we are going to walk in purpose here. Yeah? Oh yes, I will say something. Worship is a constant. Well, yes, that if we are made for worship, then it means that at, at every point we are worshiping something. It might as well be God. Because worship to the normal human being yeah, is as natural as breathing, as natural as eating. And at any point that that doesn't go towards the glorification of God, a substitute steps in. A substitute steps in and it's as easy as that. Yeah. So then you say the worship is let's say backtrack now on worship. Worship is a constant thing that gives glory to God or everything that believer does that gives glory to God. It is not just about songs, it's about your entire life. And then how to worship. Hmm. Let's go to Romans 12, 1 to 2. Hold on. I see you in my heart. Hey, yeah. Romans 12, 1 to 2. Um, let's go back to KJV. First. I beseech therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Next, please. And cannot be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let me see the next verse. Okay, let's go back. Thank you. Yeah, this is Paul's summary of worship and tells us how to worship. Let's go back. Um, so, I beseech you, brethren, therefore, by the mercies of God, that is the first outline here, yeah. the mercies of God. Why do we worship the mercies of God? Yeah, because one thing that Christians, believers, we do a lot is that whenever we come to the place of worship, we think that it is about us. 
But the truth is that as much as even he proposed to like, it is about God. It is about the Creator. He said, "For I know the plans I have of you. For I have for you, they are of good and not of evil, to bring you towards an expected end." He is the one that has the expected end, not you. Even your worship too. Your worship is to Him. It is not about yourself. So first of all, yeah, in the place of worship, you need to inform. The image of who God is to you. Because if you're only in worship for what you can get out of it, then it is not true worship. It is not true worship. Then you you are not giving glory in its entirety to God. Yeah. Because God in his conditions for relationship with him, he will tell you that you will love me with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Why? Because he doesn't want to share. You are the Lord, that is your name. You will never share your glory with any man. You will never share your glory with anybody. Almighty God, that is your name. Like the reason he's the Almighty is because he is not going to share his glory with anybody. So your worship should be informed of the image of God because he's the one at your altar. He's the one, he's the wheels beneath your wings. Yeah. And as a believer, you can have plans you can do all that but in proverbs 16 you don't bother opening it it says commit those plans to the lord because he's the one that is taking you towards the expected end that expected end is your purpose but that expected end is the final thing that you are meant to achieve in this life so anyhow we worship by the next level let's go back to romans chapter this thing romans 2 and then how do we worship by presenting our bodies a worth living sacrifice that is the how that we present our bodies in what living sacrifice. When you think of sacrifice, what's the first thing you think of? It's dead. It is dead. So how can a sacrifice be alive? Let's go to Psalm 51, verse 19. Please. Psalm 51, verse 19. Thou then thou shalt be pleased with sacrifices of what? Of righteousness. Okay. Let me give you something, bro. Yes, last week Sunday we learned about righteousness. Righteousness as what well the nature of God. And we learned that it is Jesus that made us righteous, and it was the sacrifice on the cross that made us righteous. And came into that sacrifice, we were made righteous. So, who is the sacrifice of righteousness? Sacrifices. We keep into the sacrifice. Okay, let's do that again. It's, it's as if I rushed it. Okay. Let's start from somewhere. Last week we learned that, okay, first of all, let's understand the reason why they gave sacrifices in the past. You don't need to open it. In Genesis 22, for, that was the first place that, or that was the story of Abraham, yeah, where he said, Abraham, Abraham, Tabi, Isaac, go and slaughter him, offer him on the altar, you know, and sacrifice. For, that was the first place. And then in 19 verse 16, when they asked him and this, when he was about to separate from the people that were following them, he said, um, actually open, open. Genesis 22. I'm showing you verse 16 here. Oh, oh, go back, go back. Yes. I'm coming, let me look for it very quickly because I have not got time. Yeah, just look for where it says, and listen, I am the boy who will go yonder. Ten to five, God bless you. Five. Yeah. And Abraham said unto the young man, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and I and the lad will go yonder and what? Worship. What, they, what were they going to do? Kill Isaac. They were going, they were going to kill Isaac, but? Yes. And then there were there was now a sacrifice that came out in form of what? A lamb. We understand that that lamb is what foreshadowing the principle of substitution, um, which is which foreshadowing the principle of substitution that Jesus will come and what? Die for us. So Jesus is the lamb that died for us here. Um, it was counted to Abraham as what? Righteousness from Hebrew after he did all this or to all those who believed on like the promise of this thing. 
on the promise of was counted to them as faith and righteousness through faith. But then Jesus came, and then Jesus is what? The righteousness of who? God. God. So Jesus, through his sacrifice, made available righteousness and not righteousness through works, righteousness through faith. So Jesus is the ideal sacrifice of righteousness. But then we have been made what sons through adoption. Shall I'm talking to Bible students here? Yes. Okay, God bless you. We've made sons through adoption. So we have came into the sacrifice that Jesus has made. So Jesus is not now the only sacrifice of righteousness. We are now the what? Sacrifices of righteousness. Yeah? That is how you can be a living sacrifice. You understand? So how do you worship? You are a what? Living sacrifice. Jesus addressing this issue to the, to the Samaritan woman would say that Jesus addressing issue to the Samaritan woman would say um, the Samaritan asked him, where do we worship? Because Jews say that it is only in Jerusalem. And Jesus would say, I think we read that John 14. Francis, you read about John 45, bro. Yeah. John 45. And Jesus would say, a time will come where to worship, but we will neither worship what? Here nor there. Because why? It will no longer be about offering rounds. And it will not be it will now be about offering what yourself. To worship is about offering yourself. You are the living sacrifice. You are the altar. You are the altar. It's about offering yourself. And that is the how. Because worship is not complete as my uh, vice president always told us. Worship is not complete until it is what? Entire. So it doesn't stop at the songs. It doesn't stop at the songs. By your speech, present yourself a living sacrifice. See, at every point I walk like this, I consider myself a sacrificial lamb. Do you understand? Because I am dead towards myself. For the life, for the life I live, I live through faith by Christ, who is in me. Galatians 2 verse 20. It is no longer I who lives, but who? Christ, who lives in me. I have crucified and died with him. You have killed into that sacrifice and that is your worship. That is your purpose, that everything you do in this life would inform people about what the glory of God. That they may see your Father, which is in heaven, and what his name will be glorified. Jesus, if like, and the less of that here, we will now understand why we're going to the world. Yeah, because we are talking about how we are going to shine our lights in Sunday school, in what school, work, relationship, and purposely that we are the light of the world. And we also saw where he said that if the Son of Man be lifted up, he will draw all men to himself. So it's about what showing his glory. That is the purpose of the believer. That is the worship of the believer. That is what informs everything you do. Because if you see things from a purpose standpoint, then you would understand why you would sing a song. Then you would understand why you would evangelize. Then you would understand why you would be excellent. That is the purpose driven life. And you would say it is not possible, but let's go to Philippians 2.13. Let's go to For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to what to for what his good pleasure. So even that self fear, your soul is sufficient and he's helping you to do it. His spirit is in you. So what is stopping you from surrendering to him and letting him guide you? Because let me tell you here, yeah, if you want to worship God, it's about him, it's not about how you want to do it, it is about how he wants it. The story of Cain and Abel. It is not that Cain brought counterfeit products, but sacrifices at that point were meant to kind of contain blood. Why? Because it was a foreshadowing of who? Jesus. That was why every sacrifice was informed. So Abel doing the right thing, but God, if I let's go, let's go to Genesis 4. Just let it not be as if I am eating nonsense. Genesis 4. Um, go back, go back. Yeah, one, two, 
bị phố chết phục Yes, let's go to where the Lord addressed in verse 5. <laughs> and now the Lord said to King, Why are thou what? And why is thy countenance holy next? If thou what? If thou doest well, will thou not be accepted? So it is not about how he wanted to do it, though. It is about how God wanted it. You understand? It is not about if you're saying that God is your. If you're saying that God is the all and all, the author and finisher of your faith, then at this point it's no longer about you. You have to live a purpose driven life. You have to live a purpose driven life, yeah? Because. Oh, God. Time. 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 So, like I said, let's go back to Master. Which is holy and acceptable to God for his neighbor service next. And do not be conformed to this world, but remember the how do we worship is by presenting ourselves to as a living sacrifice, and then how do we not present ourselves as a living sacrifice? We do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The renewal of our mind comes where we see things through the purpose of your life through the worship step to where everything we do is on towards the glory of the Lord. Why wouldn't I why would I cheat in an exam where? Because it wouldn't give glory to the Lord. Yeah. Why would people ask you why you are different? Why would people why would people even notice your difference? Yeah, because if you are not different, yeah, if people do not see the light of Christ, it is not dim for crying out loud. Like it's not powerless, it's not bleak. It draws all men to himself. And that's the truth. Transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, we should start seeing things from the lens of what the purpose living life. The purpose living life. See. A man that walks in purpose, yeah, is an embodiment of his worship. If you do not understand anything else, then this one. That a man that walks in purpose is an embodiment of his worship. Worship is beyond song, beyond feeling. It is about the glory. God. Yeah. It is possible. For you to live as a being in purpose, as a being in worship. Because he is the one that is in you, both to will and to do. It is possible for his fire to be forever on your altar. Because why? In oh, Leviticus 9 24, you don't have to open it, you don't have to open it for our. Leviticus 9.24 They offered the sacrifice unto the Lord in the children of Israel. Yeah, and there came out fire from before the Lord and consumed up the offering that was on the altar. Solomon offered sacrifices. Fire came, consumed it. I can give you close to 35 verses in the Bible where they went to worship God in terms of sacrifice. Wow. And God responded by what? Fire consuming the sacrifice. Judges 6.21, 1 Kings 18.38. You can either that and check it for the Lord. 1 Chronicles 21.6. So it was a constant for God to always accept sacrifices that are meant to glorify him with what fire. And if you're a living sacrifice, then God accepts your worship is on fire on your altar. It is possible to always be on fire for Christ. Yeah, what Elijah did wasn't a miracle. Because as you have seen, it was God's pattern to always accept what reasonable worship is what fire. So it is possible for fire to always be on your altar. And how is that possible? Because he is already here. 
go to win and to do. So that is where next week we are going to learn something else. Come. Come. Go for Bible study. Come with expectations. Come with expectations. Um, quite a tradition. That's what I'm going to say. Let's just bow our heads. Think of the words we've heard. I say, God, I inform myself of your knowledge. I inform myself of your power. I inform myself of myself. I will not be silent. I will always worship you. As long as I am.